Hello! <laughs> Welcome to Activity 3, Moving Pictures, the video where I just do the activity as best I can uh, and try and talk about what I'm thinking while I'm doing it. This one could be a little bit more haphazard. Um, we shall see. Um, again, it is me, Pippin, here doing this activity just like you. Let's see how I go. I mean, you would think that I should be able to do a pretty good job since I actually wrote the activity in the first place. Let's see, maybe I won't. Okay, so I'm on the activity description here on the course website. Uh, it says that I'm going to continue to get comfortable with Git and GitHub. That's a good idea. Declaring and changing variables. That's what this week has been about. That makes sense. And using map and constraint. Perfect. Sounds fun. Okay, so. The idea is we're making an animation. There's going to be two circles. The one on the left is bigger and more transparent than the one on the right. They're going to come into the screen growing. When they reach the center, they're going to stop but keep growing. I guess they're going to stop moving. And the background is going to be changing color. So, you know, it might be the case that you think you can do this without following any instructions, in which case, that's fine. I mean, the main thing is to just do some programming uh, to a large extent. But if you want to follow along with me, then let's go through these steps and do them one by one. So the first thing is creating a new project. Always good to start a nice, fresh, fresh project by downloading the template. Thank God that worked. And opening it. There it is there. OK, so my downloads folder. I hate that view on the Mac, actually, I've got to tell you. So I unzipped it. Oh, there it is there. It says rename the folder from template P5 project to 03 moving pictures. 03 moving pictures. It's a good idea to name our folders uh, after the project that is actually inside them so we can actually understand what's going on. And then I need to go to my course repository, which for me is in Documents, GitHub, cart 253, and then I want to put this into the activities folder, right? Because this is an activity, I'm just going to drag it over. Perfect. So now it is in my repository. It's in my cart 253 repository in the appropriate folder. It's got a good name, and I'm kind of ready to, to do stuff. Uh, oh, but before I do stuff, uh, it's reminding me that I should go to GitHub Desktop and actually commit the fact that I've started this activity. So let's go to GitHub Desktop. There we can see all of the files that were inside that folder that I just added. And I'm going to say a3, a3, not a hash, started the activity. I don't know, that's fine. a3 started the activity. So I'm saying a3. I'm doing this because in this class we're going to be working on all kinds of different projects inside the same repository, just to kind of save a bit of time from starting new repositories every single time you do something. So I'm using prefixes just to point out which thing I'm working on uh, when I commit. Done. OK, step one. That was easy. Back to Chrome. Um, and of course, yes, good to always start projects like this. Good. So let's make a plan. Um, so again, if I were doing this um, not for a class, I might just sort of start writing code and just sort of see what happens. Uh, I would figure that I could get things working uh, that way. But because we're trying to be a bit systematic, let's have a little plan. <clears throat> so the first thing that we would do is think about the variables that we need. Uh, the variables are what's going to kind of control everything. It's going to have all of the changing numbers that make the, the circles move on the screen and change size and make colors change and stuff. So they're very important. Uh, then we'll just do the basic setting up the canvas thing. Uh, that's just making a canvas. Then we're going to need to think about our background color. We know that that's going to change from uh, I think it was black to red, so that's going to be important. And then we'll just deal with the two circles, um, maybe one by one. Maybe we'll have to go back and forth a little bit. Uh, but we know that, for example, the left circle is going to move on to the screen, moving, I guess, from the left to the right. Uh, we know that that's a positive direction when we think about um, the x-axis. We need it to stop somehow when it hits the middle, and we need it to keep growing um, until it fills the screen. And then some stuff like that for the right circle, except that it's a bit smaller. Okay, it's quite a lot. Um, and this is like, I guess it's a good thing to, to point out, right, that just even simple programs involve quite a bit of thinking. Um, even when they're sort of 
obvious to some extent or like it's fairly clear what you need to do there's still like work to be done just to go through the steps uh, to accomplish them especially if you're talking about it while you're doing it like I am <laughs> okay so the first thing we want to think about is variables um, variables obviously is about what can change um, generally speaking we want a variable for anything that's going to be a number though in our program right even if that number is not going to change uh, it's almost always better to have it be a variable uh, anyway Okay, so there's three basic things in our program. There's the background color, there's a circle, the first circle sort of on the left, and then there's the second circle, which is the circle on the right. Now, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use JavaScript objects for each of those three things. Um, because that allows us to think about them as little units inside our program that have got their own uh, kind of stuff in them. So the first thing that we're being asked to do here is Declare a variable called bg for background. It's a little bit of an abbreviation. Could also just write, uh, write it out as background if you want. Though you have to be careful because it shares the, would then share the same name as the background function. So we won't do that. We'll call it bg. And we're just going to make a, a JavaScript object. We're not going to put anything in it yet. So over to Atom. Oh, but I haven't even opened the project yet. So let's do that first. So in Atom, I need to go to open. And I need to go to Documents, GitHub, Car253, Activities, O3 Moving Pictures. Remember, I want to open the folder that contains the project in it, not any of the earlier folders and nothing, not any of the folders or files inside the project. I want this specific folder open. Okay. JavaScript script.js is where I'm going to be doing my stuff and because I'm working with variables up here is where I'm going to do it before setup. So I said I was going to make a variable so I write let and then it was going to be called bg and I said I was going to put something in it so I use assignment and I said it was going to be a JavaScript object and I know that that's going to be something inside curly brackets like that. So I know that it's going to obviously have stuff in here that's going to be the properties of that uh, but for now, the step is telling me, don't worry about that. Just set up the basic little skeleton here. So I'll do that. And now I'm going to do the same thing Okay, for the other two. So same thing for circle one, same thing for circle two. You could also call them left circle and right circle if you wanted to. But I'll follow the steps. So circle one is going to be a JavaScript object. And circle two is going to be a JavaScript object as well. Good. Um, there's nothing gonna, there's not gonna be anything to see right now, so I'm not gonna bother running this project. I'm just gonna go back to the instructions. So I've got my three variables, good. Now, really, the more important thing, having worked out that there are three things I care about, is I'm gonna want to have some sensible properties. So let's talk about the properties for the background. Now, because I want the, the background to go red, I can tell that I'm gonna need to have three numbers when I use the background function, right? To specify the red, the green, and the blue. And so this BG variable is gonna to need to be able to set those values. It's gonna to need to know what color the background should be. And so we're gonna have properties for red, for green, and for blue. Um, again, you could call them red, green, and blue. You can call them R, G, and B. Uh, it's up to you. We know that it's meant to start as black, so they should all start as zero. So let's go back to the BG object. I hit tab there just so that my cursor would go in. This is called indenting. Um, that just makes it a little bit easier to read. So the R value is zero. So it's the first property. The letter R is the name of the property. Then the colon to tell it what's gonna be in it. And then the zero is the value. And then a comma, because I'm gonna add some more. Same thing for green or G. Same thing for blue or B. Perfect. Red, green, and blue, they're all zero. Okay, done. Add the properties for the first circle. So the first circle, this is gonna be the one on the left. We know that it needs to be a bit bigger than uh, the one on the right, but apart from that, it's just a circle. Um, we also know that it needs to move in from the left and it needs to grow. So we can already tell that there are a few different qualities or properties that this thing needs. It's gonna need a position, so an X and a Y. Uh, it's gonna need a size because it's gonna grow. Uh, and it's going to need uh, a fill property because we're going to want to set it to some kind of a color, right? And there are actually other things, um, but let's set up the other things when we need them, okay? So let's go and put those things over here. So the first circle is going to have an X. So the first property is called X. I know the circle starts on the left. 
uh, and I know that the left hand side uh, of the horizontal horizontal axis is at zero. Um, it's going to need a Y position. I don't think it actually specified that in the brief, but I'll just put it in the center of my canvas. I don't actually have a canvas size right now, but I know that I'll probably make it 500 by 500 because that's just what I seem to do. So I'll put it in the middle of that at 250. It's going to need a size. I will default its size to 100. I guess there's actually instructions about this over here. Is that what I said here? Yeah, size is 100. Uh, and it's going to need a fill. Uh, and we're going to set its, oh, it's going to need two properties for its fill because it's going to, of course, because it's going to be transparent, right? So it needs both a fill color, like a fill shade, and a fill alpha, a transparency. So its fill is going to be white. So fill is going to be white. And its alpha needs to be some kind of semi transparent color, I guess. What did I suggest here? 200? Okay, sure. So quite a few details for circle one there. Uh, but they're, they're fairly basic ideas. So it starts on the left. It's going to be in the middle on the vertical axis. It starts with a size of 100 pixels. Its fill is going to be white, 255, and its transparency is going to be set to 200. So almost completely opaque. Okay, and that's enough to do some basic good stuff with my circles. Uh, second circle, same thing, uh, except its X property should start on the right. So that would be the width of the canvas. Um, as a number. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and its size should start off smaller than circle one so that they can nest inside each other and you can see it. Makes sense. Uh, I can see that we're all going to do some other stuff later, but for now let's just do the most obvious thing. Okay, so circle two. X needs to be at the width of the canvas. Now you might think that you could write width here um, and you would like to be able to do that because that would be nice, but it won't work because if we try and use width here, if you think about it, um, setup hasn't happened yet, so there is no canvas uh, when I'm doing this stuff. Uh, so in fact, I can't talk about the width. I have to actually use a number here. Because I said I would make it a uh, 500 pixel wide canvas, I'm gonna write the number 500 there. Uh, that's sort of annoying. There are some ways around this, uh, but it's worth knowing that you can't actually use any variables uh, like width or mouse x or any of those sorts of things that p5 has built in, you can't use any of them until you get to setup. Okay, so here we have to use a number. Uh, its y should match the y of circle one, so that should be 250 so that they can nest inside each other. Uh, its size, well, we said we would make it smaller. I don't know what that means necessarily, but let's make it 75 pixels wide. That's smaller than 100. And it also needs a fill of, let's say, 255 and an alpha. Um, I don't know what to set its alpha to. 200 as well? Sure. Okay. So now we've got two circles. We know all about these circles. They don't do anything. They're just ideas right now. But we've got all of the information needed to draw the background and our two circles. Perfect. Let's get really going and actually doing some of the, the dynamic actual instructions. So the first thing we need to do is the setup stuff. Here it's telling me use create canvas so that I can create my canvas and use no stroke just to make things look super cool and edgy, non edgy, <laughs> literally not edgy. Uh, okay, so in setup, we want to say create canvas 500 by 500. Um, it could obviously be different sizes, but I was relying on the idea of it being 500 by 500 when I wrote, for example, 250 here when I wrote 500 here, when I wrote etc. So it is kind of important that I stick with that. Um, I mentioned that you could do something um, if you didn't want to rely on hard-coded numbers up here. One thing that you could do is you could say that circle two dot uh, x equals width now. So you're saying you want it to start on the right hand side now because once we're here, the canvas is being created and so width will work. So this will guarantee that whatever side the can whatever size the canvas is, uh, circle two will be at its width. Similarly, um, we could make sure that we set circle two dot y to height divided by two. Uh, and we could do the same thing for circle one dot uh, y as well, height over two. Uh, that will enable us to guarantee that they'll go in the right place, even if I change these numbers uh, for the canvas later on. That could be a good thing to do. It doesn't really matter at a, a project of this scale. Uh, and in fact, I'll delete them just so that it's not super confusing. Uh, or as complicated looking, but that is something that you can do if you want to guarantee 
uh, that your circles are being drawn relative to the actual canvas size. In the meantime though, we also said that we would set no stroke so that it is not edgy. Um, good, minimalist. Okay. Uh, again, nothing's going to happen in the program yet, right? We know that because we've, all we've done is created a canvas and set no strokes. So we're not going to see anything if we run this, so it's not really worth running it right now. Um, there's really only a point in running it. But that's not true. So one reason that it is worth me actually running Atom Live Server right now, if I go to Packages and then I do Start Server, and it uh, jumps over to here. Uh, we don't see anything, obviously, but one thing that is maybe worth doing is going to the JavaScript console and just double checking that there's no big scary errors. So we've seen there's, there's this error, but this is not really an error. This is about the favicon not existing. Um, we don't care about that. There's no errors with my code, right? Um, that's a good thing to check, just because the more code you write, the harder it gets to find stuff. Uh, it's always worth checking, like, you know, I've written at this point sort of hypothetically 41 lines of code, if I look at this line number here. Um, you know, if there was a typo or something, uh, it's nice to catch that earlier on. Okay, so back over to here. Color in the background. So I know that I want to use the background function, and I know that I want to use the properties of the BG variable uh, in order to draw it, right? And then I know that because I'm wanting it to become more red, I want to add something to the BG's R property, so it gets more red. Let's do those things. We may, basically, we want to draw the background and we want to make it get more red. So clearly we use the background command because that's the thing we use to set the background color. And we know that we've got this object up here that specifies what the background color should be in terms of its R, G, and B uh, values. So we'll just use that. So we know the first one is red, so we'll say bg.r, that's the red property in my background bg.g for green and bg.b for blue. Now the first time through this is just going to be 0 and 0 and 0 because that's what they're set to uh, to begin with. That's black. But we want it to become more red so we want the value that's inside bg.r to keep getting bigger to move towards 255. So for now let's say bg.r equals bg.r plus 1. So every frame bg.r is going to get bigger by 1. It's going to move towards 255 and that's going to make this thing move towards the color red. Let's check that out uh, over here. And there we go. Started in black, fading towards red. So we're changing the color. Perfect. Beautiful tweening effect there. Okay, so we use the properties of our BG object to specify the red, green, and blue components of our background in the background function. And then we changed the red property to make it get more red uh, over time. Okay, draw the first circle. Okay, so we know how to draw circles. So we want to, oh, and that's, that's a good point today. I missed this step because I'm going a little bit too fast. I suggested in the instructions that here we should say, we should have little sections of our code. So this is the stuff handling the background. And then we could say left circle here to say that I'm gonna start dealing with the left-hand circle. Now, the steps that we're wanting to do are set the fill using the circles fill and alpha, and then draw it. I mean, we've done this so many times in our lives. So first we want to set the fill. The first part of fill we want to set is the circles fill value. Uh, we know that that's set to 255. And the second part is the circles, uh, sorry, circle one's fill value and circle one's alpha value. So that will set up the coloring properly for the circle. And then we want to draw the circle by our standard thing of using its x, circle one's y, and circle one's size properties. So then it's going to display it on the screen. Will it do that? Let's go check. Yes, it's sitting there. It's just going to sit there because obviously nothing is changing right now. There's no stroke because we set no stroke. You can see it's a bit pinkish because we can see the red background through it because of the alpha value. So that worked. Okay. Uh, obviously I'm doing this reasonably quickly. Uh, obviously you should maybe pause as I move between steps if you're trying to do it kind of step by step with me. Uh, or not, up to you. Um, but I'm aware that I'm not pausing for sort of long periods of time to, to give you time. Just pause the video whenever you want. So second circle. Same thing, right, but for circle two. 
that, that makes sense. So given that it's the same thing, um, one thing that we could do, so we'll write our little comment that says right circle, so we know which one it is. We could actually just copy all of this across, really, really. Um, but what would we have to do to make it draw the right hand circle? We'd have to change all of these ones into twos. One thing that we can do uh, is this multiple cursor thing that Atom has. So for me, I'm using the command key of my Mac and I'm clicking to create five different cursors. So I'm able to type in five different places. And what that lets me do is delete the one and replace it with a two in all of the places that I needed to do that. And then if I click somewhere else, it's just back to one cursor. So now I've got my right hand circle. It's all of the same stuff that the left hand circle did, except for circle two. So if we go back, now circle two is there. We can see it's a bit smaller than circle one, um, but they're both just sitting there for now. Okay, so we've drawn our circles. Very good. We're getting there. Now, make circle one move to the right. Perfect. So here I'm saying that you should do this before the fill instruction. It doesn't matter that that hugely if we do it before or after drawing the circle, um, but I think that there's something kind of consistent about making it move before you draw it. So I'm going to do that. So let's add a positive number to circle one's x property so that it moves to the right. Okay, so before I fill it, which is here just after the comment, I want to say circle one dot x and I want to add something to it. So it's going to be circle one dot x plus something. I'm going to say plus one because that was what was suggested. We've seen this kind of thing before. We're just adding one to whatever circle one dot x was. It starts at zero, so this would be zero plus one is one, and then it puts that back into its x property so that it saves it as one, draws it, comes back around, sets it to two, saves it, draws it, and so forth, and we get movement. And there we go, it's moving. Now it's not going to do what we wanted, right, because we wanted it to stop in the center and it's ignoring us and just moving. Oh, but there was a nice overlap there, like the MasterCard logo. Uh, it's, 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 you know, it's buggered off somewhere. We don't know where it's gone, so it's not perfect yet, but it is moving. Okay. Now, if we wanted it to stop, there are lots of different ways that you can make something stop moving uh, in programming, and there's more sophisticated ways but we do have access to the constraint function, and the constraint function could mean we could make it so that it won't let circle one move any further than the middle of the screen, okay? So we're gonna use constraint to limit circle one's movement between zero, which is where it starts, and the middle of the screen, which is the width over two. Okay, so after we've added something to it like this, we then want to use constraint. So remember that we have to assign back into circle one dot x to make this stick we say constrain, we say the thing we want to constrain, which is circle one dot x, that's the value we're trying to limit, and we know that the lowest value it's allowed to have is zero, that's when it's on the left, and the highest value it's allowed to have is the width divided by two, that's the center of the screen, right? So after we've made it get bigger, we then want to make sure that it stays within this range of zero, which is the left, to the middle, width over two. And if we go and watch it now, it moves along, it's moving along, adding one, adding one, adding one, and then it hits the middle and the constraint is saying, you know, you shall not pass. You're not allowed to get any bigger than width divided by two, which we know is 250. Cool, well that worked. Actually, it looks like a floppy disk now. I didn't really think about that, but it looks like one of those old 5.25 inch floppy disks that existed before you were probably uh, born. And that's okay. That's okay that I know about those floppy disks. Okay, I'm not, I'm not old. Okay, okay. Here we go. So we made it stop in the center. That's perfect. And we want to do the same thing for the second circle, right? It needs to move to the left, so it needs to move negatively. Uh, and we want to do that same thing of constraining it. This time we want to constrain it differently. It needs to be constrained between width over two, between the center and the right of the screen, which is width, right? Because we want to think about the low value and the high value. So let's do that. Same basic idea though. So circle two dot x is equal to circle two dot x. Now we could say minus one, but remember that we talked about this idea that it's better to say that you add a negative number. It looks kind of stupid, but we're gonna add negative one, um, which is the same as subtraction. But if we were gonna make these into variables, like a speed variable for each one, which we probably should, the speed would be negative one. Uh, and then we want to constrain circle two dot x again. So circle two dot x is equal to constrain circle two dot x between width over two, the middle, and width, the right but not the far right, never the far right. 
Okay, so that should have the same basic effect. So it's going to move left because we've got a negative number there. So it's getting towards zero, which means moving left. And we're constraining it to make sure that it stays within the center and the right side of the screen. So if we watch that, they move together. It's very beautiful. Oh, and then they perfectly in synchrony because they both move at exactly the same speed, interlock uh, in the center of the screen and stop moving. It looks sort of uh, quite nice, really, like a sort of alien interface. And all the time, you know, the screen is getting more red. It's quite satisfying, actually. I'm, uh, I don't hate it. Okay. All right, but now the circles need to grow. Okay. So they also need to be getting bigger. Frustrating. There's so much to do in this life. So for circle one, let's make it get bigger by just changing its size. Okay. So there's two things we want to do. One is that we want to make it get bigger, so we'll add to its size. I'm suggesting adding 0.25 to its size here. That's fine. Uh, and we also want to use constraint again to make sure that its size never gets bigger than the width. So we want it to stop growing when it's the same size as the canvas, because um, otherwise it's just going to eat the canvas and we won't have the nice kind of um, targety effect that we had before. So let's go do that. So left circle is here. We could change its size uh, before or after this stuff. I'll do it after. So circle one dot size equals circle one dot size plus. Let's suggest a 0.25. I'll just slavishly follow my own directions, and we want to constrain that. So circle one dot size equals constrain circle one dot size to be between zero. It's never going to be size zero, but that's okay. And the width of the screen, so it doesn't get bigger than the width of the canvas. Sorry. Okay. So if we go over and look at that, we can see it's getting bigger. Oh, it's pretty slow. I'm feeling ever so slightly bored watching it. If you're feeling bored watching your program, maybe you should go change a number. I'm going to make it get bigger faster than that. 0.25 is too slow. Let's make it get bigger at one, at one pixel per frame. There we go. Much faster. Great, great, great. Great, great. Hurry up. Yep. Same behavior. They still both stop in the center. And because of that constraint on the size, circle one keeps growing until it reaches the size of the screen, and then constraint makes it stay at that size uh, after that. So now it looks like a very bad egg or something. I don't know what that looks like. Let's say it looks like an egg. Okay, so that's done. Um, now we could do the same thing to make circle two grow, uh, as it says here, but in the instructions I'm asking us to use map, I think. Is that what I'm trying to do? No, I'm just using relative programming. That seems fair as well. So one useful thing that we can do, we could use map for this as well, actually, but it's much easier to use multiplication. So instead of um, setting, adding a number to the size of circle two, which is the one on the, the right, we could actually just set its size to always be the size of the first circle multiplied by a fraction. So it's always going to be a proportion of the other circle. The nice thing about that is it's always relative to the other circle. So let's go set that here. Circle two dot size is equal to circle one dot size. So we're setting the size of circle two relative to circle one, right? Times, let's say 0.75, I don't know. So circle one dot size, whatever that is, and we know that this is changing, right? It's growing. We're going to get three quarters of that size, and that's going to be the size of circle two. And the beauty of that is that it's going to kind of inherit the growth of circle one. So as circle one gets bigger, uh, circle two gets bigger too, but it's just it's always uh, three quarters the size of circle one, right? So let's go look at that. So now they're both growing, they interlock beautifully, and then circle one keeps growing. And they both stop as well, right? Because circle one stops because it's constrained to the size of the screen. Circle two stops because it's always three quarters the size of circle one. And therefore, if circle one's not getting bigger, neither is circle two. Ah, that works really well. Um, I'm aware that I said in the, at the beginning of this activity I was going to use map, but I clearly didn't. Um, you could think of how to use map here to create to, to do circle two's size uh, as a mapping of circle one's size instead of uh, what we're doing there. OK, let's check in with our instructions. Right, yeah, so we're technically finished, right? Um, the screen gets redder, it gets all the way to red, um, the circles interlock, they grow, they move in from the sides, it's beautiful, it's happening. Uh, but one of the biggest things that you probably notice is that we've added a whole bunch of numbers, right? There's these ones, those are kind of, the, that's the speed, this is kind of the growth rate of circle one, so that's not great, here's another speed, 
is kind of the relative size of circle two. So there's quite a few places where there are numbers that should be variables or properties of those objects, right? So there's a few more tidying up steps. Let's do these quickly. So, oh, right, so here's a map. So let's map the background color. That's a nice idea. So instead of adding a number to the background object R property, so we've been adding one to the background to make background's red property to get it more red. Let's use map. So we're going to use map to get the R property to be based on the size of circle one. Well, that's quite nice. And we want the canvas to be red at the exact same moment that the circle matches the width. Quite a lot to think about there, but let's think about that. So here, instead of this just kind of blindly adding one to the background, knowing that it will eventually get there, let's say that the background's red property is going to be a mapping. And what we're going to map is the size of circle one, so circle one dot size. We know that circle one's dot size, the circle one's size is between, well, what does it start at? It starts at 100, okay? So we know that it starts at 100 and we know that it ends at width, right? Because we know that we constrain it to end at width. So the range of circle one dot size is from 100, the smallest, to width, the largest, okay? And we're wanting to map that to a standard color number, and we know that that's between 0 and 255. So at the start, when circle size is 100, it's going to be using 0 as the range that it's going to. So it's going to set bg.r to 0 at the beginning. And as it moves towards the width, as it grows towards being the width of the canvas, it's going to be also changing bg.r to grow towards 255 over that same amount of time. Let's make sure that that works. Indeed, it is working. So now the redness of the screen is being controlled by the diameter of circle one. That's nice. So that's a good use of map. Um, clearly, we should set speed properties for circle one and circle two. That's just a classic. So here we're adding one to circle one dot x. We should really have a circle one dot speed there, right? Same thing for circle two dot speed, circle two dot speed there. Finding numbers and destroying them is a good thing to do. Uh, obviously, I can write it here, um, but I have to actually still add it to the object up here. So uh, what do they say? Speed. So after size, maybe, circle one, add a speed property of one. Don't forget your comma. Notice how when I didn't have the comma, the word fill has kind of gone white. That's a way that you can tell that you're missing something, uh, which is a comma that makes it turn red. Same thing for circle two. Uh, its speed is going to be negative one. Remember I talked about how it's better to have a negative property, the negative property that you still add uh, to its x position. Okay, so now those have been changed to numbers and our code looks that little much better, but better. These now look a little bit more sensible. Uh, and you can probably imagine that we're gonna also wanna change this one. Let's call this circle one dot growth rate, I guess. That seems sensible. So we're adding the growth rate. So again, we've got growth rate, so circle one dot growth rate here. We need to add it as a property of circle one. So let's add that after size. I don't know if this is completely the right place to put it. Growth rate, uh, and it was growing at a rate of one. So I set it to one. So growth rate, colon, one, comma. So we've added that property. Okay, and then the Final one that really sticks out like a sore thumb, there are a couple of others we could actually tweak as well if we wanted to, is this 0.75. So for this 0.75 kind of represents the relative size or the sort of ratio of circle one to circle two. So we could call this circle one dot I don't know, size ratio or something like that. I don't know if that's a, the perfect name. Uh, sorry, but circle two dot size ratio, right? So in circle two, its size is gonna be set to circle one size times the special size ratio that circle two has. So let's go set the size ratio, size ratio to 0 0.75, three quarters, okay? So now, again, it's, it's worth noting that it's really nice having all of this information up here at the top. It makes our program really easy to change, right? If I go back over and look at it, uh, here, for example, circle two's size ratio is 0.75, uh, it's very easy in this program now to say, oh, actually, I'd like its size ratio to actually be 0.5, so it's half the size. And then immediately I go back, and now the circle is half the size. It's really easy to edit in that way. Oops, looks like a nice hat as seen from above now. Okay, so we've changed all of those nefarious numbers 
Um, I see that here I called it relative size. That's also completely fine. Um, naming things, so long as you're being sensible, uh, is, is okay. Add more comments. That's a good thing to do. Uh, and of course, commit and push is always the right thing to do at the end. So I'm pretty satisfied with this program. I've got nice JavaScript object variables controlling two circles in the background. I've got quite a bit going on here to animate my things uh, moving around. So let's go back to GitHub Desktop. And let's, I mean, it's a bit unfortunate, but I'm going to have to say A3 completed the activity, compelted, completed the activity. And I'm going to say in the description, sorry, I didn't commit more often. If you're working on a project and you're doing, you know, work that you're going to hand in, it is a good idea to commit a little bit more often. I understand, though, as you can see, how you can get excited about just kind of making progress and you forget to commit. Generally speaking, though, if you do something that appreciably changes your program, you should be committing as you go. I probably should have committed, you know, once I got the two circles on the screen, once I got them moving, etc. cetera. Uh, but, I, but I didn't, um, and, you know, that's life. Commit and push. And we've finished that activity, okay? So that was, a, that was me running through the activity. Uh, obviously, feel free to ask me questions uh, about this. Uh, this is just my thought processes uh, in terms of how to do these things. You may have different ways of approaching it, uh, and if they still get results, generally speaking, that's a good thing. We can always talk about the finer points uh, later on. So that's it for me for this video, uh, and I'll see you in the next one.